All right, guys, let's get started. Today we're going to talk about a propagation on networks. So in previous lectures, we spent studying the network properties. You know, we learned how to identify um, the important nodes in the network. We learned how to uh, find, you know, how to find communities on network, how to detect network cores. So today we're going to be switching topics into the processes that might be happening on network. And uh, one of the, I would say, most interesting process is the propagation of information on the network. So we're going to talk about what's called epidemic models. And, uh, you know, the, 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 this, the models, the original epidemic models, dates back to uh, beginning of the century. Uh, they were, like, very, very simple. And they did not take into account networks. And those models has been reformulated on, on the networks uh, only probably 10, 15 years ago. So it is you know, old stuff, but kind of re-engineered and, and rethought of um, and applied to networks. So why do we want to do it on the networks? Um, and um, actually, this is a quick uh, outline for the lecture. You know, we'll, we'll look at several models and we'll look how information spreads. So why do we want to do this on the networks? Well, you know, just a few examples um, of, of quite recent studies. Uh, now, what you see here is this friendship network where people know each other. And the red dots are those, those infected with flu. And then, you know, the network has been monitored um, in terms of the flu propagation. So how flu spreads um, among uh, friends, right? And so the red nodes are initially those that are infected and yellow nodes that are their neighbors. And then we can watch through time how infection propagates and how more and more people um, get infected. And obviously, you know, with flu, um, you get infected on contact. And so your, your contact network plays critical role here. Um, another sort of motivating example is slightly different, but it also involves networks. So today, everybody travels and travels a lot. And so, you know, whenever epidemic starts somewhere, let's say, you know, in, in Asia, it actually spreads around the world very, very quickly. And in this case, the network that transmits epidemics would be transportation networks. And what you see here is just a bunch of passenger, it's, it's a passenger flow between major airports in the world. Right. And depending on that flow, of course, you know, there is a probability that the passenger is sick and, and he, trans, you know, he brings in disease um, across the continents in different countries. And you know, I can give many more examples of why networks are important uh, when studying disease propagation. Now, we're going to be talking about diseases because, again, it's sort of one of the, you know, most impressive uh, applications. But in fact, if you think about how news or rumors propagates in social media, it is very, very similar. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the model of disease propagation in the network, and then we'll see how it can be applied to analyze you know, news spread or you know, how, how Twitter news um, propagates or, or you know, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So things where there is no centralized source, but uh, instead of that, we rely on sort of word of mouth propagation. Um, and this model, models, the model we're gonna study right now can be used to um, also you know, study uh, rumors. And, um, you know, in pretty much in all this uh, science of, of epidemics, and, you know, whenever we talk about rumors, you know, the goal is pretty much, uh, the goals are pretty similar in terms of like what we want to know. We want to understand, you know, if, if disease, if there's an outbreak of disease, how far it would go, right? So how many people will actually eventually get it? We want to know how fast it's gonna happen, right? And so these are like sort of two fundamental questions. So the, 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 the range of the disease, and the speed of, of the propagation of the disease, or you know the range, how far the news can go, um, and uh, you know how fast um, they will spread. So, you know, I'll jump right away in, into the modeling uh, part of this. 
compared to previous lectures, there is no uh, sort of ready-made solution uh, within iGraph that will just allow you to type in, you know, propagate the news, propagate the rumors, propagate infection, and, and, and the function would, would return you the results. Um, here, uh, we'll probably need to do, you know, some, some, some coding, or I don't know, maybe guys will provide you um, some initial code you can, you can work from. So what we're going to do now, we're going to actually talk a little bit about mathematical model and then look into how, you know, we can simulate this model uh, using, you know, so using some software, right? Okay. So what's given? Well, we have a network of potential contacts. <coughs> it's, you know, it can be social networks or whatever interaction networks. And traditionally, when we study epidemics, um, the nodes or the actors, uh, people in this network, um, divided into three categories, right? It is susceptible. So those that could be infected, um, those that are currently infected, that's usually you know, susceptible, infected, and um, the third category is recovered. And dependent, depending on the model that is, that is being uh, considered, Sometimes we just have susceptible and infected people. Sometimes we have susceptible, infected, and recovered people. And we're going to talk about it in a, in a few slides, uh, like you know how how those how how that can be used. Now we're going to be building what's called probabilistic models, which means we're going to calculate the probabilities that node at a particular moment of time is infected, right? Um, Probabilistic model means, you know, in mathematical term, there is, it's a probability. If you try to simulate, um, you know, the, it's, you know, it's going to be either infected or not, but depending on your, uh, the, the way you simulate things, you know, if you run it again, uh, you might get like different picture. There are several parameters of this process that are important, right? First is, you know, if you're in a contact with somebody, uh, there should be some, infection rate, which means, you know, it can be one, which is, which means, you know, whenever you're in contact with someone, you know, you just instantly get um, the infection from the person. Um, you know, in reality, it's not true, right? There is certain probability that you can get infected. So you, even if you're in, you know, in the room with somebody who has a flu, you know, there is not 100% chance that you're going to get it. So one of the parameters of the model will be infection rate. So the second parameter of the model is going to be a recovery rate, or it's a rate with which a uh, you know, person recovers from the illness. Now, when recovering happens, it does not depend on your neighbors, right? You know, uh, you, 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 your body fights off the flu, and you recover on your own. So it doesn't really matter what happens you know, surrounding you in terms of um, if somebody else is sick or recovering, um, you know, you're, you're recovering on your own. That's that's a model assumption, uh, and of course, you know, it, it's not every disease uh, can be described this way. But sort of the most generic term, and we're going to look at the network um, which is connected, right? And so all nodes are reachable because if the node is not reachable along the network, you know, it's it's very clear, you know, it's never going to get um, infected, right? So pretty much all this theory is based on the model uh, from mathematical epidemiology. And the model goes back to like 1927, right? So this is sort of a new or updated version of that model that takes into account probabilities and takes into account, you know, graph uh, or, or network. All right? Okay. So just to be more precise, and again, what I want to do is I want to formulate a mathematical model, right? You know, get to the, to the point where we, we, we have equations. We're not going to solve them, but, you know, I, I just want to sort of show that whatever we're talking about can be expressed in mathematical terms. So, so there are two processes as, as we talked about, right? There is a process of infecting and there is a process of node recovery, right? So when node... One, one node get infected, it can get infected from its neighbors. And um, the way to think about it is the following. Let's say we look at the central node. So the probability 
that this node gets infected can be calculated in the following way. So first of all, that central node, in order to get infected, has to be susceptible. So at that moment, when we're considering infection, it shouldn't be infected, shouldn't be sick, right? We're not looking into this sort of reinfection thing, right? Um, it's, it's, it's healthy, becomes infected. So first of all, it's a probability that the node is uh, in a healthy state or susceptible. And then it can get infected by any of his neighbors that are infected. And so what we're looking at is this is a sum of probabilities. This tells you that the neighbor is infected, right? And um, it's, you know, and, and, and the sum goes over all the direct neighbors, right? So it's a neighbor and that's it, that neighbor is infected. Um, delta T just says, you know, it's, it, you can get infected during, you know, time delta T. But the, the last part that is important here is this coefficient beta, beta that tells you like the probability of infection. So what this says is again, this says um, that the node is susceptible so it can get infected. This says, okay, here's my nearest contacts um, that are infected and could potentially transmit. And this is a probability of that transmission. And so, you know, we need all these three events to happen. And so that's why we multiply them through. And that's how you formulate the probability of uh, a node being infected from its neighbors. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, you know, the opposite process is node recovery. Well, it does not really depend on your neighbors. You just go from the state, you know, red, which is infected to the rate, to the state gray here, which is healthy. Um, you know, the, the only thing you need here is that, okay, well, the node is infected and this is the probability that the node is infected and gamma is the recovery rate. So, the, so altogether it gives you, gives you the notion of the probability of recovery. And so these two processes, they sort of compete, right? So, you know, you can get infection from the neighbors, you can, you can get recovered. There are several models, classical models, that, that describe this, the infection propagation. So the first, uh, which is the simplest, is called SI model. And the idea is the following. So a person can be susceptible, and then uh, you know, the person gets infected. And that's it, right? We're not considering here uh, this recovery process. It's actually just going, it, it's just, we're just looking at the infection propagation. We don't care about like sort of recovery story. Um, you can think about this, um, you know, it, it's actually a very good map into, in, onto like rumor propagation, right? Um, you know, susceptible person is the, the one that does know rumor and infected, well, you know, somebody just told him that rumor, and, well, and that's it, you know, you're done. You know, you know it, you cannot un unhear it, right? You just became infected. Um, and then you can, you know, for example, that will start spreading it yourself. So, you know, to formulate the equations, uh, you know, there are a couple things we need to understand. One is since a person or a node in the network can be either in this infected mode or in susceptible mode, but it has to be in one of two of those and, you know, X, I, X uh, sub I and S sub I are probabilities, they have to sum up to one, right? Because you know it's either you're either infected or you're you know susceptible to infection, and then you can write actually sort of dynamic equations of the change of the probability of the node being infected in a unit time. And again, I'll just sort of you know I'll walk through this. We're not going to solve it, but just so you understand what what sort of we're trying to write. So the probability of the node being infected at time t plus delta t. Right, so we have a we're in, in the moment of time t. You know, we want to see what's going to be happening like after delta t, right? You know, step forward in time. So the probability that the node is infected consists of two parts: uh, the probability that the node is infected at time t. So you know, if you were infected, you know, you remain infected. Plus, the probability that you're going to get infected from your neighbors. And we already looked at this formula before. 
it just says, okay, the probability that you were, that the node uh, was susceptible, so not infected, then this is a probability that your neighbors are infected and you're connected to them. This is your adjacency matrix. And delta and, and beta is infection transmission rate. And so all together it gives you this equation, which can be written as a differential equation and in fact can be solved. All right? Now, we're not gonna solve it right now. We're gonna look at a slightly different approach and the, uh, the approach we're gonna look at is modeling, where you know, instead of writing equation, we'll just try to model this process, like, 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 you know, like um, it's called agent-based modeling. We're gonna think about sort of agents and, and well, agents, uh, you know, the nodes as, as units, and we're gonna try to model what's gonna be happening with them as, as um, disease spreads. So, here is a story. Every node um, at any time can be, as we discussed, in the state, you know, susceptible or infected. And when we start simulations, we initialize a few number of nodes to be infected. And then on every step of the simulation, you know, we just sort of clock is ticking, on every time step, each node has a probability to infect the nearest neighbors. And that's about it. So we have a node, let's say it's infected node, there are neighbors, and there are, like, I would, I would draw this graph. And let's say this node is infected. And um, at every moment of time, you know, we, we, we'd start, you know, clock, and on every step, uh, there is a probability that it's going to infect its neighbors. And let's say the probability, if the probability is 50%, uh, is going to infect probably like half of its neighbors. And so, you know, we start clock. Okay, finally, it's getting it infected this neighbor. Then you start to look at this neighbor. Um, on the next step, this neighbor can infect, for example, this neighbor. And so the, the disease spreads around. And we literally model it. Okay, so I know, I mean, you know, we can talk a lot, a lot about this. Um, let me show you what it's gonna look like if we actually try to build this type of a model, you know, on, on the real graph, um, that would probably make more sense. And then we'll come back and discuss a little bit more of these equations. So the example here is for beta, which is the transmission coefficient is 0.5. Um, this is a network. And let's say at the initial moment, these two nodes are infected. So these are the sources of infection. And then we'll just start simulating. So there is a node 17 and, and, and 11, 5 and 17 that are connected to those red nodes. And so on the first step, time step, they have a 50% you know, chance to get infected. So let's see what's gonna happen. So pretty much when you do simulations, you know, you flip a coin, all right, you know, it's they, they get infected or not. So here I'm actually flipping, you know, going through several um, iterations already. So from nodes six and seven, nodes 11 and five got infected, node 17 didn't get infected. Um, but then, you know, node one also got infected from one, on the next iteration. And, you know, if you look closer here, uh, you, you probably can see this, you know, I highlight uh, by red, you know, the, the, the edges that transmitted the infection. So we start from node six, seven, you know, the infection went to 11, five, and then it went to one. And, you know, we keep, can, can keep you know, thinking about this infection as a propagation. Um, and, you know, the process continues, nodes infecting its neighbors. Every time on every time step, the probability is 0.5. But since there is no sort of recovery process, you know, somebody gets infected and stays infected in this model, um, you know, slow, slowly but surely, the entire graph gets infected. And so this parameter, which is, uh, you know, the, 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 the infection rate, really only controls the speed with which 
or the pace, right, with which the infection spreads. But, you know, eventually everybody gets infected in this model. Okay? So there is no recovery. And so eventually everybody gets infected. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, um, it's actually good to to sort of to 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 represent or to to monitor this propagation using some parameters. And so, what we see here is the following: the blue line tells me how many uninfected nodes I have in the network as of, as the time goes by. So this is time access. And the blue line just it counts how many uninfected nodes we have. When we started, there was like 32, you know, nodes in the network, I think, right? And there was probably like, you know, 30 uninfected, and then it goes down, 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 down with time and pretty much goes to zero, which means everybody got infected. And the red line is the number of infected nodes, and it's growing with time. Now, it's not very smooth because the graph is very small, but if you had a like, larger graph, it would be much smoother, all right? So, so what those lines tells you that, again, at the beginning, we had only like two infected nodes, and at the end, pretty much everybody's infected, right here, right? Everybody's infected. And the blue line is the opposite line. Uh, it just tells you, okay, um, how many uninfected we had. So this is infected and this is uninfected or susceptible. And, and so by the end of the story, <coughs> by the end of the modeling, everybody is infected, okay? So this is a very, very simple model. I mean, very unrealistic because in this model, nobody recovers. And, you know, we know that whatever, you know, disease we get, people actually tend to recover, right? Or, you know, die. So, and what we're going to do next is we're going to take this model and add a little bit to it to make it a little bit more realistic, okay? And that then becomes interesting. But I wanted first to go through this setup, you know, to, so you understand a little bit better what's happening. Um, and, and so, um, well, I should have, of course, done this, this, this line in red, right? <laughs> the smooth line in red, the same one as, as in here, just tells us um, how many infected nodes we have. And, you know, critical, this growth rate of this infection really depends on, on, on the eigenvalue of the matrix or, you know, depends on the structure of the graph. So depending on the graph structure, you know, the rate with which infection propagates changes. Now, since the graph is connected, eventually everybody will be infected. But the pace, the speed with which infection spreads depends on the parameter beta, the one we talked about, but it also depends on the structure of the network. And <coughs> we're gonna see in a few examples later on how structure plays in you know, critical role. But again, the important part here with this model, eventually everybody gets infected. Everybody knows the rumor. Any questions about that model? All right, moving on. So the second model is <clears throat> called SIS model. So <coughs> it, it, it models the process of susceptible nodes becoming infected, and then becoming again susceptible. So this is something like with, again, like with, with a cold, with a flu, where, you know, you get the, you get the flu, right? Um, you're susceptible, you know, you get the flu, you become infected, then you recover, but you're again susceptible. So, you know, well, actually with flu, you might get, um, you know, your immune system might learn and will not let you get infected again, but let's say, you know, cold, um, situation where you can, you know, get it again very quickly. So the difference here from the previous model is that there is a process that increases the number of infected people, 
because you know susceptible people get infected. And there is a process that decreases the number of infected people. People are getting recovered. And so um, again, thinking about this and writing equations, you know, the the change in number of infected people is dictated by the growth due to infection from the neighbors and friends and decrease due to recovery process. And the two parameters here, beta is the infection rate and gamma is your recovery rate. And so you can again write an equation and you can again uh, you know, solve those equations. We're gonna do the same thing as before. We're gonna look at the simulation of this process. So now simulation is a little bit more involved. So every node can be, you know, again, in the state of, of susceptible or infected. And we need initialize nodes in infected state. But when the node is infected, it would stay infected for a few iterations and then recovers. Because again, remember we introduced this recovery process. You know, when you get sick, you're not just staying sick forever, you recover. And when you recover, you again become susceptible to infection. All right? And, and so that's sort of the, the, the dynamics we want to put into the model. Let's take a look. It's the same type of a model. I mean, the same network. Uh, we'll introduce 50% rate, um, you know, 50% uh, a 50 percent rate of transmission of infection, right? And we'll say, okay, the recovery rate will be, you know, will be will be five, but that means that it, you know the node stays infected for two iterations and then recovers. Now you might ask, like, why why these numbers? Well, just you know, simply because for this sim small model and the small graph, you know, produces results that, that, that are meaningful for us. But obviously, you know, this infection rates and this, you know, the, in the intensity of recovery, if you want to model like a real system, um, you know, they have to come from experiments. Like, I don't know, you know, if, if, you, if you get cold, uh, it's, it's a week for you to recover, right? And, and you know, whatever the, inf you know, depending on, on the virus, whatever the, the, the the rate of transmission, you know, the way, the, the intensity with which infection spreads, it really depends on the virus. So those two parameters usually, usually come from, you know, experiments and observations. Here in the simple model, I, I just said, okay, well, look, let's, let's set them up to be that way. We'll see something interesting in the model. So again, those two guys infected at the beginning and we start uh, iterating model, um, you know, after a few steps, notice that some of the neighbors got infected and we keep iterating. But now compared to previous model, what happened is these two guys that were originally infected, they recovered after two steps, right? So again, looking back, you know, we start with them as infected, then they infected neighbors, then they recovered. But, you know, infection persists and you know, keeps spreading to other nodes, okay? So this model is a little bit more realistic in the sense that, right, you know, some people get infected, they recover, the infection, you know, moves on uh, to, to their friends and, and, and friends of friends, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, people get recovered. They can get reinfected again uh, from their friends uh, later on in the process. So there is no immunity built in. Um, and you know we can we can watch this process. Different nodes get infected, and and recovered. And what's interesting, you cannot just you know easily see it from the picture. But when we build when 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 we build the the graphs, you will see that though different nodes get infected and and recovered, on average, the number of infected nodes and recovered nodes remain the same. So with a particular you know, infection, 
with a particular disease, you will always have, for example, like 50% of population infected. But, you know, people rotate. People who, who are infected will rotate, will change, you know. Some recover, some get sick. Um, but overall, the, the, the percentile of the population that is sick will remain approximately the same. So again, if you look through this, through these pictures, you realize, you know, some nodes getting, you know, reds, others some become blue again. But on average, the ratio of the number of blue and red nodes, you know, more or less preserves. Okay? And so that means, you know, this, this epidemics, you know, just keeps hanging out in the population. And that's actually what happens typically in winter, right? You know, you get, there is always certain number of people who, who you know, who are, who are sick, right? And, uh, you know, the only question is, if it's like 10% of population who's always sick, that's okay, right? Now, if it's 70%, that's, that's, that's a problem. Um, so these are those the curves I was talking about. Now, again, because we have a very small, you know, small experimental set, only 32 nodes, these curves are, are sort of shaking, but they, you, you, you can see the idea. The idea is that number of infected nodes were small at the beginning, then it's growing, and, and then it sort of, you know, reaches a certain value and just hangs out out there. And the same happens, of course, with the opposite curve, which is number of susceptible nodes that are not infected. It decreases with time, but then sort of stays at a certain value. Again, what happens um, here as the time goes by, and, you know, those lines will, will, keep, will be next to each other for a long time, what happens is you know, different people recover and get sick, but the percentile of the population that is sick or recovered you know, remains the same, okay? So just disease goes from one people to another, you know, then comes back, but uh, uh, overall the, like, sort of, you know, the ratio of recovered and diseased people remains the same, okay? Make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah, Some reaction, okay, okay. So now, that was one scenario. Now I'll actually change parameters. I would say, you know what? Let's, let's, let's still have, you know, two days for recovery. You know, it's, it's a very easy recovery for this, for this particular disease. And let's also reduce uh, <clears throat> the transmittability of the disease. I mean, let's reduce the infectiousness of the disease. It was 0.5 before, which means it was like 50% chance that the neighbor gets the disease. Now let's make it a 20% chance. So let's say it's a 20% chance when the, when the node has a disease, it's a 20% chance that the that, that, you know, neighbor of the node gets disease. So we're kind of reducing um, the intensity with which disease transmits. Let's see what happens in this case. <clears throat> so those are the same two red nodes. You know, they, they, they infect the neighbors. Now it infects only one neighbor because, you know, beta is smaller, but it does infect it. Now they recover themselves. You know, that node start infecting other nodes. So it's very similar to the previous story, um, but it's just sort of smaller infection size. And, you know, it continues that way and it continues sort of that way. But eventually, disease dies out. And so now this is a very different end story for the infection. With the previous parameter setting, the infection continues on in the population. In this parameter setting, it actually died out completely. Right. So, you know, the model has its threshold and threshold that depending on those two parameters, the, the, the infection rate and the recovery speed, the model can either predict that the, the infection will go on or disappear. And these are those curves, the same curves as we saw before. You notice we start with some small number of infected nodes, the number of you know, them increases, 
but then start decreasing, decreasing, and goes to zero. A number of susceptible or people who, who are not sick, at first decreases, but then re recover, you know, returns to like everybody is, 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 is healthy. So it's the same model, but depending on those parameters, beta and gamma, or you know, tau, um, the, the time, um, it behaves differently. And so there is a, what's so-called epidemic threshold. And the epidemic threshold, you know, depending on the model, uh, is slightly different, but it is the ratio of beta to gamma, right? The ratio of two parameters. And it's sort of, you know, understandable in some sense, if your infection rates are much, much higher than recovery rates, you know, you get, uh, you know, pretty big population infected. Other way around, uh, if, if recovery rate much faster than infection rate, well, infection will die out uh, without touching the entire population. And this threshold is in fact, and again, I'm not gonna go into the details of this, you know, can be calculated and, and you know, in this particular model, it's inversely proportional to the, uh, you know, first eigenvalue for, 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 for the graph. You know, for us in, in plain English, it means that the threshold depends on the structure of the graph. So again, for some graphs, uh, infection can spread much easier than, on, for, for, than on, on others. And that depends on the graph uh, structure. Okay, I'll pause here for a second. Um, any questions on, on, on this model? Because we're gonna switch to the next model. And we're guys very quiet. So what does it mean? It means it's clear, not clear, not clear at all. You're asleep. So uh, why it's one for eigenvalue? One over one eigenvalue. Yes. Right. So eigenvalue is. Eigenvalue is, is what? <laughs> why it's uh, just one uh, over eigenvalue? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, right. I, I cannot, I mean, you know, honestly, in this course, I cannot explain, I cannot give you a good explanation why it is so. Um, but just for you to like, you know, to, to give an impression, graph is described by the adjacency matrix, right? And the property of the adjacency matrix completely contains within its eigenvalues and eigenvectors because the matrix can be completely restored from eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And so it happens, if you look at the equations, that the propagation of this infection is dictated by, you know, a first eigenvalue and the first eigenvector. And then you can show that this, this threshold is, you know, one over lambda one. You know, I, I mean, without going through the math, I cannot, uh, Give, give a good explanation why it is so. Now, just for, for, your, for, for understanding, and we'll, we'll, we're gonna look at this threshold a little bit later on a simpler model without graphs. And for that model, if, if we didn't have a graph or if the graph was fully connected, and fully connected means you know, every node can interact with every other node, then this threshold will be equal to one. Um, if you're interested, like, you know, where you get those numbers from, either check out papers, you know, textbook, or, you know, the, the other lecture series we do at the computer science department, um, where I actually derive these equations. Okay. All right. Um, All right, let's move on. Now, final model I want to consider is called SIR model. So remember, so we started with SI model where we have, you know, susceptible people becoming infected people. Then we looked at this SIS model where susceptible becoming infected and again recovering. And now we look at this SIR model. So the difference is the following. It's all susceptible people, they get infected, 
but then they recover and you know either and by recovery it means well here it means either they become immune to the disease so they cannot get reinfected or um, you know say within within the disease they just die and so they just remove from population so sometimes R is called recovered sometimes R is called removed okay and you know think about like well much more dangerous disease than the flu you know you can think of uh, plug or or any other like strong infectious disease after which the body uh, you know, the, the, the human body becomes immune to it and so you cannot get reinfected you're literally then being removed from this population of people who can be infected so now we have three states possible states for the for a node it can be susceptible it can be you know infected or it can be removed it becomes removed only after the disease, right? Somebody catches the disease and then it either recovers or it sort of you know, dies and gets removed from the population. And again, you can write equations and you can solve them. And again, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna look into, you know, in, 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 into simulation. Oh, and by the way, sort of going back to your question about those lambda one, if you actually solve these equations, you know, that's where sort of lambda one will, will come in. Um, but we're not going to do it. We're going to just look at the at the simulation. And here, you know, since we have three different states, the node could be in like this S, I, and R. Uh, the simulation is a little bit more complicated. So first of all, uh, we initialize nodes to be you know infected. Then we say, okay, each node can be stay infected for several steps. Uh, and while it's infected, it can you know, infect the neighbors. And after those steps, it becomes recovered. So it just changes state to recovered and cannot get infected anymore. Okay? So it's sort of removed from propagation of infection. Um, you know, is, is, is it clear the, the sort of the, the conditions for the model, right? The setup? Yes. Okay. So now we're going to have like, you know, we, we'll still have two parameters. Right, the pra one parameter is is uh, uh, the intensity with which you know, infection uh, spreads. The second parameter is the recovery rate, uh, so how fast recovery happens. But we will have three colors on the graph because we have nodes that are um, susceptible, which is blue, infected red, and you know we'll have green uh, for recovered nodes. So the same story. We start with two nodes here. Um, that are infected, um, where was it? Yeah, that are infected. And I already like skipped a few slides. So, you know, it, it infects, they infect their neighbors uh, and the neighbors keep infecting the neighbors and sort of, you know, the, the, the infection progresses. And then what happens is those nodes that were infected, they recover, right? And so if they recovered, they cannot get infected anymore. They cannot transmit the disease. All right. And then again, we'll just keep, keep playing this game. Now disease um, continue, continue spreading across, continue spreading across, continue spreading across. And eventually what happened is all the nodes recovered. Okay, so all the nodes went from the state susceptible state to infected state to recovered state. Okay, um, so disease died out, but every person, every node went through it. So if it was a plug and it was like, you know, 1600 or 1700, pretty much they're dead, right? Uh, today, you know, it's, it's much better. But you know, everybody in the population went through it. And these are the curves that corresponds to the process. So what we have here is the red curve, which is the number of infected nodes as a function of time. So here we have time. And the infection increases. You get lots and lots of infected people, right? But then the number of infected people start decreasing. 
And the reason they're decreasing is just because, you know, it's like a fire and it runs out of, of, of wood to burn, right? Because, you know, a lot of people got disease, then they start recovering, they cannot be infected anymore. And, and so the number of infected people decreases and eventually goes down to zero. So to compare to previous model, which was SIS, you know, the, the, there is a situation where, where the, the number of infected people, you know, remains pretty much the same. It's just different people get infected. Here, you know, you get a peak in infection, right? You get a peak at some moment of time, and then uh, the infection drops out, and eventually, um, you know, everybody, there is no more infected people. It's gone. Um, the number of susceptible people, you know, start decreasing, 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 and then goes to zero because, again, everybody eventually got the disease. A number of recovered people, those who went through the disease and recovered, or, you know, you know again, in, in the worst case scenario, died, is growing, growing, growing until it reaches the entire population. So that's like sort of a very bad epidemics, right? It just went and swiped through the entire population. Now, we could have actually a little bit different situation when the parameter changes. Again, what I'm doing is I'm keeping the same, um, the same time for, for the recovery, how long it takes for a person to recover, but I will reduce the, 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 you know, the intensity of, of the infection, right? Um, again, instead of like infection being able to infect 50% of your friends, uh, you know, in this model, in this case, it infects like only 20%. So again, we start with a bunch of nodes as in, you know, here is infected nodes. Um, what happens is because infection rate is smaller, you know, it, it infects only one node and this guy recovers. Um, that node might infect another node and recovers himself eventually. You know, a couple other nodes, you know, yet another node and then infection is gone. So with this model, what happened is infection is gone. Some people got infected and recovered, or, you know, again, in the worst case, they died, but majority population is untouched, right? They never went through this, through the infection. They never went through the disease. And, you know, if I try to draw the same type of, of curves as we did before, uh, you know, here, this red, the number of infections will decrease with time and, and go to zero. Um, you know, the number of susceptible people will decrease because, you know, some of them get sick, but again, you know, stays at a certain level. And um, number of recovered people or the people who went through, through the disease, you know, it's growing and then just sort of stabilizing also. So it is a very different picture from the previous story, right? From the situation where you got, you know, all the population infected and, you know, those two different behaviors of the model is again controlled by the ratio of those two parameters, right? Beta and tau or, or you know, beta and, and gamma. Gamma was, you know, one of tau, one over tau. And uh, sort of that's the key message uh, of all these models that, you know, depending on the ratio of those parameters and you know, epidemic threshold, if it is greater, you know, infection becomes an epidemic. An epidemic means, you know, everybody got eventually, everybody went through this and everybody got, got sick or um, it, it remains sort of contains and, and dies out. And it's again about the ratio of the, you know, intensity with which the, the, the infection being transmitted over uh, the recovery rate, how fast people recover. And this ratio controls pretty much the behavior of the model. And, uh, you know, for the graph, you have to compare it for the network, you have to compare it to this one over, you know, first eigenvalue. That would be the sort of the critical threshold parameter. Uh, for if you don't have a graph or graph is completely connected, it'll be just one. But again, the key message is, there are two messages. First is that these two parameters that are important. And the second, that the graph itself, right, the way things are connected are important. Um, and to sort of con 
to 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 emphasize this second property here's a simulation done on various types of graphs right so the first one you know this is one which is um, random network this is lattice this is you know small world we talk about the sort of artificial model um, this is called um, you know spatial uh, and this is the last one of scale free graphs so the simulation and the modeling was the following you know we we we, we set up a few nodes uh, let me change the color you know a few nodes red and then you know see how infections spreads out right set up a few nodes red and see how infection spreads out and eventually what we want to do is we want to draw this type of a graph and this is a function of time and that's you know number of infected people and you know depending on the graph this 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 picture will be different right for some of those graphs the infection spreads much faster and and so you know the, the, the this hump will be much sooner for others it might take longer to to infect people for somebody it will be like you know taller for some others it will be shorter so now before i show you next slide that contains the answer by looking at this and sort of thinking about this 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 process on which network do you think the infection will spread the fastest so for which network will have on this graph you know very very fast peak <laughs> beginning out of this five networks scale three so you think that this one will be the fastest yeah. okay and the slowest one Latest, latest. Lattice, okay. Slowest. Any other guys' suggestions? Any other ideas? So why do you think this is going to be like number two will be the slowest? Uh, the uh, longest. Uh, <clears throat> the local, a lot of local connections, right? Uh, because the diameter of this network should be uh, long. Yep, I think it's a very reasonable, you know, approach. You you look at the diameter, you look at so how far you can get, you know, in in one step, and in a in a, in a, in a, you know in in the graph in the lattice, you you, you get only to the four nearest neighbors. While say in the small world, you can get pretty far, right? Um, let let's see what the results are. The actual results. Um, and, and you're right that um, you know for the for this for the lattice it actually you know it's 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 one of the sort of lowest and and smooth out peaks and in terms of time it takes very long um, to get there now um, it's actually interesting that both random graph and scale free are very fast in terms of spreading of the of of the disease and I guess for you know again for scale free it's a small world network random graph is also possess also possesses a small network phenomenon so both of those um, no and of course both of them um, have this connectivity pattern that helps uh, disease to, to spread around very fast um, and, and you can build those curves just by you know literally simulate now one last thing which is I think is actually a very very cool picture um, is the following. Take a look at, take a look here. The, what, what we see here is this is a green node, which is a source of the infection. This is the blue node. Um, we're going to sort of look at it later. So the green node is the source of the infection and the infection spreads around the network. And of course, you know, if you look right now at the network, um, you know, there, there are nodes that are directly connected to the green nodes, but they're not necessarily next to it, right? They can be like sort of long connections. And that's where the infection, you know, pops up, right? 
And so if you look from the sort of, you know, top view on, on how infection spreads on the network, and this is time, you know, that's what we see. So this is the modeling for, uh, you know, one, one of the modeling um, where, you, you, you know, you have infection, you got, you got uh, neighbors um, infected, inf eventually infection dies out. Um, and, and that's sort of pretty much the same, the same type of picture as we saw in my simulations. But the, the slide B, uh, you know, the, the row B is quite interesting. It actually the same infection showing from the point of view of the green node from the center of the infection. So for, for this guy, he infects the neighbors, right? And neighbors infects the neighbors and neighbors infect the neighbors further, et cetera, et cetera. So for him, it's sort of a concentric, um, of course, propagation from him. And C is that this picture is like this guy, this guy as a recipient of the infection. He just sees and watches, sits and watches how infection actually surrounds him and eventually gets him, right? So how infection uh, starts spreading from this green node and other nodes start getting infected and how eventually it sort of converges towards him. So it's kind of, you know, cool visualization that in, in fact, if you select the right frame of reference, you know, this complex patterns of infection propagation on the network actually looks very simple. You know, it's those uh, concentric, you know, circles of infection going from, you know, from, from, from the source. Um, you know, very cool picture, very cool paper. Uh, if you're interested, take a look at it. Okay, before we switch to to like second topic, and it's going to be a short topic. Um, any questions here? All right. So I, um, <clears throat> what I, what I expect you to know from from this story is that there is this S I S I S and S I R models, right? And those models describe those models describe propagation of infection. And, uh, you know, the, the key sort of parameters are um, the, the rate of infection spread and then the recovery rate. And depending on this ratio of these parameters, infection can either become an epidemic or die out. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio of this beta and gamma has to be compared to some metric, in particular, you know, it's, it's one of a lambda. Um, that comes from you know graph structure. So on the different graphs, infection propagates with different speed. So that's sort of the key message uh, from 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 the previous story. Now, switching to social contagion, um, you know, it, it is more about like how you know rumors can spread, ideas, information spread, and of course you can easily easily map that into you know map into into the previous story right so you know susceptible it's a node who doesn't have you know information doesn't have doesn't know the rumor but can get it you know infected is a person who actually is spreading the rumors uh you know a recovered might be a person who heard the rumor but not spreading it anymore right like sort of got tired of of, of you know telling this to to the friends and just stopped doing it yeah. And then it's exact mapping of, from the model we just described onto this infectious diseases, right? Um, then we just don't have to do anything. Now, there is a sort of simpler approach um, to modeling, you know, sort of rumors on information propagation um, on, on, on the network where, um, you know, we, 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 don't, so we don't look into this recovered Kind of people. What we what we're thinking more about this Twitter model, right? When somebody heard the news and then retweeted it, right? Heard the news and retweeted it. So that's slightly different sort of model of behavior, and you don't really need to go into all this epidemiological story to model that. And that's what we're going to look at, you know, for, for on the next few slides. It's actually called a branching process or very simple contagion model. Where, and I, again, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, I'm using this terminology of infection, but again, think about, you know, Twitter. So that, you know, each infected person on every step meets K new people, 
and can transmit infection to them with probability p. So you know, every new person can you know retweet can 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 retweet to any of their friends, and any, uh, and uh, the friends with the probability p will actually retweet his message. Okay, so a person has k friends, and with the probability p, those friends retweets whatever they get from the guy. So then, uh, you know, the way to model this is, okay, well, let's say this is a person with a message, right? And he tweets to his three friends and with a probability P, you know, one of them actually retweets, so, you know, they, they, re, they can retweet um, and then and, and the other picks up and et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, you know, if that happens, you know, the, the information can spread now, depending on how you know active your friends are, in the sense like how large is this p? If p is equal to one, and everybody retweets, then of course you know your information will will spread out very very fast because you know you have ten friends, each and every friend retweet your message. So you know after two steps, you know it covers hundred friends, and after three steps, it's thousand friends. Who knows it? But if not every person retweets it, but only, I say, 50%, the rate with which the information propagates will be slower. And if it's like one of one tenth of the people, it's going to be even more slow. And the message here, uh, we can actually easily show it. I'm not going to go into the details, but what's important here is the product of the probability of the retweet times number of friends you have. And it's also sort of easy to understand, you know, if you have 10 friends uh, and the probability of retweet is 0.1, um, then on average, it's only one person who will retweet your message, right? And so if it is one person who retweeted your message, so let's say this is you, there is one person who retweets your message. And then again, let's say yet another sort of person and the same kind of probabilities, then your message is not being sort of magnified in the sense it's not covering more and more people on every step. It just, you know, not dying, but, but just being transmitted one person at a time. What you want to, you know, what you would like to see, of course, is this situation where you, you know, tweeted several people and each of them tweeted more people, et cetera, et cetera. So when the process is actually sort of, you know, it increases and spreads and spreads. And, and so in this case, these are the two parameters that control it. The number of friends and the probability that they're gonna retweet, right? And um, it's actually the same, the same idea uh, as, as uh, you know, previously that there is an epidemic threshold. And uh, if P times K is equal, or if P times K is less than one, which means on average, you know, less than one person retweets your message among your friends, then your message will die out. If P times K greater than one, you know, the message will propagate and, and cover a lot of grounds, will we'll reach a lot of people. And so these are sort of the, the parameters, again, that you, you might, you know, in the model you control, in the real life you can calculate. And uh, I'll skip through this. Um, you, you know, there, is, there was a, actually a pretty interesting experiment done in um, 2009 with, uh, you know, actually the, the interesting part of this experiment that it was, you know, it, it was a real scientific experiment, meaning, you know, people were recording what was happening, right? And so they have a trace of, of what was happening. So, for example, there was this online email newsletter and, uh, you know, you get an email saying like, look, um, this is a newsletter and by the way, you know, can you forward it to other people you think are interested in the subject? Plus, I mean, of course, you know, these days nobody will bother to, to, of, of doing it, but the, the researchers actually provided some reward for spreading the information, right? And, and so, you know, the, here's the result, right? They, they start with 7,000 people uh, and, 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 you know, they, they observed those cascades of how information propagates. And for example, the largest they saw 
had 146 nodes and, and depth of eight steps. So, and here is that cascade, right? So this is a, sort of the source of the letter who sent it to people he knew. And then some of them, these dark nodes, decided to resend this information, right? And it sort of spread it further. The white nodes are those who received the letter but decided not to, you know, not, not to resend it. And so again, he got here and out of this guy, out of all the letters he sent, only one, two, three, four, got uh, actually five, six got activated and resended it further. And so again, if you look at this, there are these parameters. There is sort of number of friends or number of recipients of your letter, of the letter that pe people sent out and the probability that they will resend it, right? Um, and for this particular graph on average, um, it was, you know, three, three, three friends, or, you know, the, the resend was down to three people. Um, and the probability of that they will resend it was, you know, zero, zero, 008. And by the way, if you multiply this through P times K, it will be much less than one. It's much less than threshold. And so, you know, this cascade, this information cascade didn't go anywhere, you know, it died, it died small. And, uh, you know, the, the authors of the experiment were trying to, to, in, to create a bigger cascade, but again, since it's scientific communities and not like, you know, cute kittens, they, they could make people uh, forward and, and, and share that information more. Um, but, you know, compare to, we can compare this to the example of, of mem diffusion on, on, on Twitter, where certain things goes viral. Um, and for the situation like, like right here, or, or right here, this product P times K will be much, much greater than one if we start um, looking at it as, as a model. Unfortunately, with Twitter, we cannot, like, we cannot trace uh, really easily all, all the steps, how things being retweeted. Um, and, and, and so, you know, the model here is quite approximate. But there are, like, if you're again interested, there are quite a few papers um, out there that talk about you know, diffusion of, of information on Twitter. So that's pretty much it. Uh, that's all I wanted to cover. I guess the messages are, you know, the, there are, there are well-defined models uh, of, inf of, of uh, infection propagation on networks, right? There's SI, SIR, SIS, and, you know, based on those models, you can actually look at infec infection and you can look um, at, uh, you know, rumors and news propagation. And if we're talking about things like retweets, those simplified model, there is this branching process model um, that, that, that can explain it. And, and in both models in, you know, infection model and in this branching model, there are several parameters that uh, control the, the, the infection um, or the rumor propagation. And, you know, really, it is the probability that whoever gets this rumor can retweet it times the number of people you, you know, you can get, you can send this to. And this product is, in fact, is just expected number of people you know, or average number of people who will retweet it. And if it is greater than one um, in the process, then the number of retweets will increase with time. If it is less than one, it will shrink with time and, and your message will just disappear. Um, and that's pretty much it. There was a lot of information, but do you have questions? Oh, it's no questions. No questions. All right. So do you guys, um, Jan Dej, are you guys going to show today the disinfection propagation? Yes, so we'll show how to do this in R and some uh, libraries for uh, demonstrating simulation of epidemic model. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Bye thank you. now. Bye. So we'll start in five minutes our class. Right. Bye.